Okay, well, I'm part of a Facebook group at the moment of about 100 people who have committed to reading the whole Bible through between the 1st of January and Easter. So committed to reading the whole Bible through, we've possibly many of, this, of us have done that on a number of occasions, but that's, that's fast. <laughs> that's a short space of time. So it was actually started by Ben and Samantha Good. Actually, Samantha's idea, I think it was. She's not actually on Facebook, so it all comes through Ben. Um, and they are some global interaction missionaries that we support in uh, Malawi. And uh, they had this idea of setting up this challenge, and I can tell you it is a challenge. We have to read great chunks of chapters every day just to keep abreast. There's one day in the week that is a catch-up day, Sunday. I think it's supposed to be a rest day but it's a frantic catch-up day, I think, for many people. And I put a, a message out on Facebook last night and said, so, because I thought the group had gone a bit quiet, um, how are we going? Who's still in? Who's out? Who doesn't know anymore? <laughs> and we've probably got about 60 or 70 responses. Largely, people are still in. Some are way back in where, so we're up to, oh, I can't remember what we're up to. Thank you. We're just finishing Isaiah. I've been reading it very closely, obviously. Um, and some are, yeah, are way back. Some, some are ahead. How does that happen? I don't know. They haven't got jobs or lives or something. <laughs> That's all I can say. I feel a bit bitter about that when they say, oh, one guy said he was in Matthew. My goodness. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, whatever, whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, it... So it's a lot. So there's two, two, two things that are challenging about it. It's actually a lot of reading. I mean, I mainly listen to mine while I'm on the uh, cross trainer, which is a good thing. I'm getting fitter than I used to be. Uh, so, many, so many passages to listen to. Um, so there's a lot to get through. But I have to say, it also takes quite a significant mental and emotional toll reading at that rate. Because you see, it's one thing to read, especially because we're still in the Old Testament, some of those tough Old Testament passages in isolation and, you know, from time to time. But when you're reading the stories, bang, 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 straight after the other, it, it's tough. And I have to tell you that at times I have felt physically sick because of the seemingly relentless violence and oftentimes very heart sore and overwhelmed, which I've never had before in the, the pace that I've read before or the way that I've, I've read before. But two things keep me going with this rapid read through. First thing is that it does actually give you a different perspective. It's probably worth doing once in your lifetime. <laughs> I don't know, maybe more often. It does give you a different perspective and it forces you to consider things that a slower pace wouldn't ask of you. So that's something that's worth doing it for. But second, and more importantly, I think, I keep going because I believe that the Bible is one of the significant ways that God reveals himself to us. I keep going because I believe the Bible is God's story and I've come to learn that because it's God's story, it's also my story and our story. And so I keep reading and I keep looking with the Spirit's help to see what the stories reveal about God and what they reveal about me <laughs> and what they reveal about us and what they reveal about his plans for human history. Okay, now back on day 23, which was the 23rd of January, we read the story of Abigail. And that's the story that I want to bring you on this long weekend. We're in a Got a couple of weeks off between series, and uh, Josh and I will do a standalone message each. And I want to tell you the story of Abigail. So settle in. It's from 1 Samuel 25. I'm not going to put the words on the screen. I'm going to tell you the story. You can read it later or follow it in your own Bible if you like. Okay, so it's in the book of Samuel. Now, in case you don't know, Samuel was an extraordinary person in Israel's history. He's one of the few, maybe the only one, that there doesn't seem to be a harsh word said about. <laughs> Um, which is really unusual. Even the best of the kings and leaders of Israel get harsh words said about them. I think the worst you hear about Samuel is that his kids go a bit off, off the rails. But he's an incredible person. He was a priest, a prophet, a judge, a military leader, and just, yeah, an incredible leader in Israel's history. And this story happens at, at the time of his death. So he just died, and all of Israel um, had gathered for the funeral, including a young David who'd been running from Saul and was in the wilderness, but he'd come out of the wilderness of Maon for, for the funeral celebrations, and then um, he'd actually gone back into the wilderness because Saul was still chasing him, um, trying to make sure that David couldn't be a king by killing David. Okay, so that's the immediate context. Now, it was also sheep shearing time, which meant that it was a celebration time, a bit like harvest festival for those who own sheep. 
And there was a custom for sheep owners when they were doing this shearing festival that the idea was that they would need to, at some stage, take some of their produce and make it as a gift to someone who was in need. That was one of the customs, one of the ways they celebrated this, this festival, the shearing festival. Now, there was a man called Nabal, whose name meant fool, and I'm not sure that his parents gave him that name. Maybe they did, but it seems like, oh, beautiful boy, let's call him fool. <laughs> How's that going to end up? Uh, you know, so there's some, you know, maybe it was a nickname that he earned through life. Maybe the, uh, the storyteller writing this story was trying to make a point in here. But anyway, there was a man called Nabal, whose name meant fool, and he lived in this wilderness area that David had been running around in, near a town called Carmel. He was really well off, had lots of sheep, so the, heart, the shearing time was you know, a big time for him. He had lots of goats. And he was known to be really wealthy, but he was, he was known to be crude and mean as well. They were the things people would say about Nabal. He was married to a woman called Abigail, and her name apparently meant, my father is joyous. <laughs> um, so obviously very glad when she was born. And she was known as a beautiful and sensible woman, Abigail. Okay, so in keeping with the customs of Harvest Festival hospitality, David sent word to Nabal, because David's, uh, David's back in the uh, wilderness with about 600 men trying to get away from Saul. He sent word to Nabal asking for some provisions for himself and his men as they travelled in the wilderness. David sent 10 of his young men, apparently, to Nabal with a message that went something like this. Let me read it to you. Peace and prosperity to you, your family and everything you own. I'm told that it is sheep shearing time. While your shepherd stayed among us near Carmel, so here David's referring to the last time he was in the wilderness, so they were uh, near each other. When your shepherd stayed among us near Carmel, we never harmed them and nothing was ever stolen from them. Ask your men and they will tell you this is true. And the backstory to that is that shepherds and their flocks, where the shepherds would go out into this wilderness area to look for water, to look for food, they were often... Um, doing so at great danger. They were at risk from uh, Bedouin tribes. They were at risk from wandering groups of travellers like David and his men. And often they were in very vulnerable situations and people would attack them, steal the sheep and so on. So the messages uh, went on. And it, but the story there, of course, is that David's men hadn't attacked in any way. And in fact, we'll find out later that they act actively protected Nabal's shepherds and sheep. The messengers went on, so would you be kind to us, and since we have come at a time of celebration, please share any provisions you might have on hand with us and your friend David. And then they waited for the reply, which went something like this. Remember his name is Fool? <laughs> Who is this fellow David? Nabal sneered to the young men. He knows who David is. His next sentence is, who does the son of Jesse think he is? <laughs> He clearly knows who David is, hey, he knows his, his line. There are lots of servants, he said these days, who run away from their masters. So, you know, he called, he called David a runaway slave, which is a pretty big piece of slander back in the day, especially when he knew clearly that that, that wasn't David's story, that wasn't who he was. So knowing full well who David really is, he goes on saying, should I take my bread and my water and my meat that I've slaughtered for my shearers and give it to a band of outlaws who come from who knows where? That was the reply. And there was nothing for it but for David's 10 young men to take that message back to him. And when he hears it, David is not happy. His first response is to grab his sword, start strapping it on, and he yells, I want 400 of you, grab your swords, you're coming with me, the other 200 stay here and watch our gear, we're going to sort this. And he's off. He's angry. His response is violent, and it is not well considered. None of us have ever been in that situation, have we? No, no, no. Okay, so that's happening. David set off. He's angry. Back in Nabal's place, I love this bit, Nabal's uh, men don't waste a single moment of their breath or time going to Nabal to say, what have you done here? They go straight to Abigail, his wife. It's a bit like they've had been in this circumstance before and they know they need to go straight to Abigail. And they tell her everything that had happened and they said to her, look, David's messengers made a really fair request, but he screamed insults at them and they said, he's so ill-tempered that no one can even talk to him. Do you know anyone like that? <laughs> Are you sometimes like that? Am I sometimes like that? It's interesting, isn't it? 
so ill-tempered that you can't actually even just reason and, and rationalise and, and talk through. And then uh, Nabal's men went on talking to Abigail. David and his men have been very good to us, they said. Uh, we, we never suffered any harm from them. Nothing was stolen from us the whole time they were with us. <laughs> it's like, that's a really good thing. Well, I suppose it is, but good on them. They didn't steal. <laughs> Um, in fact, day and night, there was, they were like a wall of protection to us and the sheep, so they actually helped defend them. You need to know this, Abigail, and you need to figure out what to do, for there is going to be trouble for our master and the whole family. Trouble for them, clearly. So they've gone with great confidence immediately to Abigail, and for her part, she wastes no time. Without her husband's permission, because she wouldn't have got that, and without his knowledge, because that certainly wouldn't have helped, she quickly organised her servants to, to get a modest donation of food. It wasn't actually too extravagant, really, when you consider David was um, looking after 600 men. She sent uh, 200 loaves of bread, the story says, two wine skins of wine, uh, five sheep that had been slaughtered, about 36 litres of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 fig cakes. So a modest donation, but I guess she was hoping it, would, uh, it was something she could easily and quickly get to him, and it would appease the situation. And she said to her servants, um, put, put this all on the donkeys and get going. Go ahead of me, and I will follow you shortly, which she did on the back of a donkey also. But David and his men were well on the way by now, and Abigail runs into them in a mountain ravine. And David is still fuming. As, as she runs into him, he's saying to the group of men that were close by him, a lot of good it did us to help that fellow Nabal. We protected his flocks in the wilderness, and nothing he owned was lost or stolen, but he's repaid me evil for good. And then he says this, May God strike me and kill me if even one man of Nabal's household is still alive tomorrow morning going to end badly for someone, that one, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so that gives you an idea that he's, um, he's pretty cross. Still pretty cross. Abigail runs into David, effectively, in this mountain ravine. She quickly gets off her donkey and she bows low before him. And she says these remarkable words, I accept all the blame in this matter, my lord. Please listen to what I have to say. Hmm. Let's listen. Because then with great wisdom and skill, Abigail launches into a quite an extraordinary speech. First of all, she pacifies David. It's, all, it's my fault, she says. Look, here's the food. I've got this sorted. Don't worry about it. And then she goes on and says, I know Nabal is wicked and ill-tempered. Please don't pay any attention to him. He is just a fool, as his name suggests. But I never saw the young men you sent. So she's kind of saying, okay, why did, almost, why did you send them to him? If you'd come to me, we'd have a different story going on here. He's just a fool. I never saw the young men because we wouldn't be in this predicament if I had. I would have done the right thing. And she continues her speech clearly and deliberately addressing David with respect as her superior, and she persuades David to see the, the position from a whole different perspective. She says this, Now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, since the Lord has kept you from murdering and taking vengeance into your own hands, so she's not afraid to call it what it was going to be, murder, <laughs> let all your enemies and those who try to harm you be as cursed as Nabal is. And here is a present, the food that is, that I, your servant, have brought to you and your young men. Please forgive me, she says, if I have offended you in any way. The Lord will surely reward you with a lasting dynasty, for you are fighting the Lord's battles, and you have not done wrong throughout your entire life. That's unlikely to be perfectly true, but you get the gist. She's talking about his overall character. So isn't this interesting? Abigail takes responsibility. She steps boldly into that space, you know, you talk to my husband, he was a fool, why didn't you come to me? Uh, and she takes full responsibility for what is happening here. And then she encourages David to be a man who repays evil with good and who leaves Dave, uh, God to deal with evil in his own way and own time. Just like she knows that um, David to be, he, he is that sort of man. The grab your swords, come on, we're going to kill them all, is not David. She is basically saying to him, it's not you. Think about the man you really are. Think about your character. And there's a reference there back to uh, the opportunity he'd had just recently to kill Saul. David and his men had been hiding in a cave and Saul had come in, hadn't realised David was there. David was close enough to actually cut a piece of um, cloth off, off Saul's uh, garment, close enough to kill him, 
but he didn't do it because David didn't knew it wasn't his right to do what was only God's to deal with. King Saul was the appointed king. It wasn't David's right to kill him, to take life from him. He needed to leave that in God's hands. So this was, this was the sort of character that, that David really had. And Abigail reminds him that he's that sort of man, a patient man of good character who's not given to unnecessary violence, a man who trusts God. And she reminds him that his future and his destiny is in God's hands. And she encourages David to live by faith and to wait patiently to let God um, do what is right in his own good time. And she says to David, even when you are chased by those who seek to kill you, your life is safe in the care of the Lord your God, secure in his treasure pouch, she says. But the lives of your enemies will disappear like stones from a sling. That's a great image, isn't it? <sighs> Their lives will disappear like stones shot from a sling. When the Lord has done all he promised and has made you leader, king of Israel, don't let this episode be a blemish on your record. If you don't let this be a blemish now, then your conscience won't have to bear the staggering burden of needless bloodshed and vengeance. Not a wise woman. Don't do this thing. Because God's going to make you king in his own good time, and you don't want to go into that role with this terrible, um, needless bloodshed and vengeance. That will be a staggering burden on you. And Abigail clearly expects God is going to work things out for David. And, that, and clearly she thinks God's way is the better way. So she stops now, and I like to think, you know, can you imagine, here she is, this woman on a donkey, well, she's on the ground now, but she's delivered this speech to a fired-up David and 400 of his men. I imagine it was very quiet for just a moment, at the very least, while everybody went, oh, now what? <laughs> now what? And David said this to Abigail, "'Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, "'who has sent you to meet me today.'" Thank God for your good sense. <laughs> Bless you for keeping me from murder. So he repeats that, that word back. And from carrying out vengeance with my own hands. For I swear by the Lord, the God of Israel, who has kept me from hurting you, that if you had not hurried out to meet me, not one of Nabal's men would still be alive tomorrow morning. David acknowledges quite specifically the two things that Abigail had saved him from. Unnecessary violence and not trusting God to do what is good and right in his own time. The two things that he says, you saved me from unnecessary violence, and you saved me from that terrible thing of not trusting God to do what he was going to do. And then David accepted her gift of food and told her, go home in peace, I've heard what you've said, we will not kill your husband. Now when Abigail arrived home, she, she found Nabal... Uh, had thrown a huge party. In part, it was the, the festival time that I told you about, but there was no doubt some celebration of, ah, I showed David who's who here, and he, had, he was throwing this huge party like he was a king, the story says. And he was very, very, very drunk, so she decided not to tell him anything about her meeting with David until he'd sobered up. So the next morning, she tells him uh, what had happened, and the result, the story says, is that Nabal had a stroke. <laughs> And he lay paralysed on his bed like a stone for 10 days. And then the Lord struck him and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise the Lord who has avenged the insult I received from Nabal and has kept me from doing it myself. Nabal has received the punishment for his sin. Wow. And the story's not quite over yet. It takes up all of that chapter, chapter 25. Uh, it goes on, and David proposes via messengers to Abigail, which isn't very romantic, is it? But there you go. Don't try that at home, I suggest. He proposes via messengers to Abigail, and Abigail accepts. And actually, there wasn't just one marriage about this time. There was two, because David also married Ahinoam from Jezreel, making both of them his wives. So David gained two wives in a fairly short space of time, kind of to make up for uh, the loss of a wife just a short while back. Her name was Michal. And uh, she was David's first wife, and she was a daughter of Saul. And Saul had actually given her away to another man, um, probably to sp spite David, but certainly to try and um, reduce the likelihood of him getting uh, appointed king through family ties and lineage like that. 
Um, so Saul had given her away to another man to reduce, he thought, David's chance at becoming king through marriage. Now, if all of this marrying sounds a little bit too much like the buying and selling of goods, <laughs> well, that's because in the context of the day, it was a lot like that. There's not much else I can tell you other than that. It's not an attractive fact, but there you have it. All those marriages were to some, all these marriages and others were to some extent politically significant. That's often why they happened. I'm not saying there wasn't other stuff going on there. I'm sure there was some true love in there at different places as well, but they were politically significant. As I said, when Saul gave away David's first wife, Michal, David lost some of his claim to royal lineage, but in marrying Abigail and Ahinoam, David gained significant political ties in Hebron and Jezreel, which enhanced his power base in Judah, which in turn helped him when he did step into the kingship. So you could, you know, that's part of the, the chess game, the politics of that, which God was in, in God was, you know, playing out. Okay, so there's so much that can be said about the story of Abigail, and I'm sure that you have questions and concerns about what you heard, have heard, and when you actually read it for yourself. And I hope you do, because I don't think you can honestly engage with a story like this without some questions and concerns. I, I want to know, yeah, I'm not sure that you can. That's my opinion anyway. So I want to encourage you to read the story for yourself. And I want to encourage you to do it, remembering that the purpose of the Bible is to reveal something of who God is and how he's at work in human history. So if you can read through that filter. And what I want to do in the few minutes that we have left is just offer you a few... Um, thoughts which might become a bit little, they might, they might help you start in your reading, they might help you structure up your reading. So the big filter we're going to read through is what does this story reveal about who God is, who I am, who we are, and, and how God is uh, playing out his story in human history. You've got to read through that filter. But here's some other things you might want to think about. There's a saying, violence only gives way to violence. When Abigail showed up, she averted violence by acting with wisdom. I think she acted with great emotional intelligence, with courage, and with a practical plan. She wasn't just full of a glowing speech and wise words. She had a plan. She'd got the food sorted. And I think that's really important. So as you're reading the story and you see that for yourself, I want to ask this question. Where might you... Or where might we as a church need um, to, to show restraint in the way that she encouraged David to? Or help someone else perhaps to show restraint as she did by acting wisely, intelligently, bravely to avert unnecessary violence. And violence can be all sorts of things, physical, spiritual, emotional, financial. Where what might we need to show up? What is something practical you, we, can do in that space? So maybe keep that in mind as you read the story for yourself. Here's the second thing. There's another saying, act in haste and repent at leisure. I think there's a version about marry in haste and repent at leisure too, but I chose the act in haste. Act in haste. When Abigail showed up, she repainted, if you like, the circumstances with a long-term view and a big picture God perspective, didn't she? She encouraged David to be patient and to leave God to take the right action at the right time. So my question there for us is, where might you, where might I, where might we as a church need to do some repainting to include the long-term and big-picture perspective and let God be God? Good questions. There's another saying, this one's from Proverbs, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. When Abigail showed up with her wise words, David proved himself teachable. He recognises God's voice in Abigail's words and he changes his plan to reflect God's wisdom revealed through Abigail. That's a pretty extraordinary thing and that is a mark of the character of, of David, King David. He, could, he learnt to recognise God's voice wherever it may have come and was open to changing his plans accordingly. So the question I want to ask there as you read that and think about that element of the story is, so how teachable are we? How teachable am I? How teachable are you? 
How do we know? Do we know when we are hearing God's voice? How do we test that? And then are we prepared to change if needs be once we've identified that's God's voice? One more. When Abigail showed up, God was revealed as trustworthy. God was shown to be intentionally engaged in human history and God was revealed as good. That was the, a result of her showing up in the space that she did. Because when Abigail showed up, she called David to be a king who would prefigure the king, King Jesus, who came to reveal God to us, reconciling us to God and each other. Jesus, who never acted with violence to accomplish God's plans. Jesus, who waited patiently for the right moment and the right action to show the world God's love. As you can see how in her showing up, pointing to those characteristics of God, calling David to that, in yet another way, because it happens all throughout his story, King David became a, a prefiguring of King Jesus. I am really glad Abigail showed up. I really enjoyed reading that story. Her story is part of the way God has revealed himself to be trustworthy to all of us. She's long dead, I realise. Her story is part of the way we see God has always been intentionally acting at the right times and in the right ways for the good of humankind. Because she showed up, she's, she's a part of that revelation of who God is and how he is working in our history. When Abigail showed up, she was part of the story that God is writing, uh, writing to reveal himself in Jesus, who himself acted at the right time and in the right way to show us how good God is. That's what Abigail did when she showed up. She was part of the story that God was writing to reveal Jesus. May our lives do the same. When you and I show up, what do people experience of Jesus? When you and I show up, what do people experience of Jesus?